Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the uh, Board of Selectmen, we lack a quorum at this moment. Uh, we just, we'll just proceed with the, the pr presentation. We'll have introductions. Uh, here is Mr. Tom Hull, he's a Selectman. Uh, Lincoln Barber, he's our Building Commissioner. And you all know uh, Mrs. Callahan. Uh, and I'm Joe Raposa. Uh, if uh, I would like the, the presenters, uh, if they're uh, comfort, if you'd like to introduce yourselves at this time or as you come to the podium. Yeah, I think it would be best um, if we have um, a lead off uh, to begin uh, the presentation, only because you're not all wired, so it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, just um, I think Joe has done a really good job on um, opening up the fact that we're here with the Urban Land Institute um, this evening, who have been here um, all day today, but has done an, an awful lot of advanced work. Um, hours of uh, poring over um, documents and uh, an actual briefing binder that the town put together. And so today was the here and now day for the town of Millville uh, to look at two very important properties. Um, this board uh, in the past has brought it up as part of their ongoing agenda uh, to try to come up with uh, a game plan for not only the old town hall, but also uh, property along the river that is deemed um, very important to the town and is the old uh, site for the U.S. rubber mill. So uh, we have a group of people here who I believe will walk us through the presentation that they put together today. And we've been so fortunate to have their expertise, and it's been a very, um, I think, informative day, and hopefully the, the town will be able to gain some insight from all of your experiences, and perhaps you can also articulate um, all the different backgrounds that you're from. So I would invite, um, Malika, I can't see you. Yes, I think you're gonna be the first person up, <laughs> and you can explain to people um, what you're here um, to do for the town of Millville. Thank you for having us. My name is Monika Bowman. I am the Director of Policy for the Urban Land Institute, Boston, New England District Council. Um, ULI, the Urban Land Institute, is a global nonprofit that focuses on the responsible use of land and the development of that land. Um, we represent the New England District Council, which is just our nomenclature for a chapter. We leverage the thought leadership of our members to go into communities to fulfill our mission, which is the responsible use of land. We are here um, as a part of our TAP program, which is our technical assistance panels. We leverage our members to provide thought leadership around very challenging land use issues. And so our members are from a diversity of sectors in land use. They represent development, finance, planning, public sector, private sector, and they all come together to make sure we're able to fulfill our mission. So at this point, I want to bring up our members who led this process for us today, Jamie Simchek and Ronnie Slani. <coughs> Yeah, I'll just. Um, Does this look okay for you with the lights on? Is everybody okay with that, um, or would you feel better with the lights off? It's up to you guys. I want to make sure. This one switch affect yeah, all the lights. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, the only thing. Yeah, that's good. That's a lot better. Yeah. Okay, why don't we do that? Because it will Is show it okay up much better. I think so. Yeah. I think you can see it better because. Is it okay with our presenters? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he has it because it's patched into his system, so it's okay. Um, so, thanks again for having us. Um, uh, my name is Jamie. My name is Ronnie. And uh, and we have a great bunch of panelists. They'll come up and introduce themselves. Um, and we've got some great ULI staff, and 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 we've got Clea, uh, our tap writer. Um, we also want to thank Mass Development for, for making this all possible as, as the panel sponsor. Now, the, the questions we, we were asked to, um, to discuss was, how can the TAP help the town identify and maximize the development potential of both 8 Central Street and 181 Main Street properties with the highest and best use redevelopment plans? Uh, the second question was, what are the specific action steps the town needs to take to realize the success uh, successful redevelopment of both properties as soon as possible. And third, can the TAP assist the town in, actually, in actual marketing 
of such redevelopment plans to interested parties to each of the two projects. Now, you know, once again, I want to thank, you know, everyone for having us here. I want to thank um, Joe and Jennifer and Lincoln for, for, you know, helping us today, all the people that, um, you know, we interviewed. So first we started off with a briefing um, this morning, um, then we did a site visit, and then after that we had some great stakeholder interviews. Um, uh, that included, uh, you know, business leaders, uh, property owners, merchants, residents, developers. It was very useful, gave us some great insight. And, uh, and then we, you know, in the afternoon, we, we put our thinking caps on and you're seeing now, uh, you know, what we discussed and what we've come up with. So what did we hear? Do you want to do this? Yep. Uh, so we heard a, a lot from the stakeholders who came in today. And once again, thank you for coming in. Um, the first thing that we really heard from everyone is that the bike trail is a huge asset to the community. Uh, we were able to go out there today and it's beautiful. Uh, the weather is perfect. We also were able to go down to the riverfront, which is also another asset to the community, the Old Town Hall and the historic nature of it, and the new business revenue with the new businesses coming in, including the uh, cultivation business um, and the ability to add to the tax base for the city, for the town. We also uh, learned about the one-time non-recurring uh, revenue from the sale of several city uh, parcels and how that's being added to um, to help cover expenses for the city. And then we um, heard about the location of Millville and how central it is to getting between Worcester um, and Providence and other surrounding towns and how that really helps uh, market the, the, the town. For challenges, we heard um, about frug frugality, um, a very nice way of saying that there's sometimes a limited resources that the council um, or the um, chair Alderman, I guess, <laughs> sorry. Selectman, Alderman. Selectman. Yep. Um, sorry about that. Um, have to, um, you know, really uh, figure out how to allocate the resources and that can be challenging. Um, we also heard about the geography, uh, the shape and the size of the city sometimes, or the town sometimes prohibits um, development or um, sometimes prohibits the tax base and can cause a challenge. We heard about uh, the town regulatory barriers, so the permitting process and how it may be a little bit confusing to business owners or residents to navigate, and which makes it a little bit harder when um, it's not a full-time staffer due to limited resources. We also heard about environmental issues at the two sites. Um, we know that there might be some contamination and asbestos, which can pose a problem for new development. And then we also heard about water and sewer limitations. So that's really talking about um, the need for wells and not being able to tie into a public infrastructure. Uh, this creates a problem because it can determine what type of business can come there. You may not be able to attract a restaurant because they don't have enough water to support their operations. And then we also heard about government and civic capacity. Um, you know, trying to engage the entire community in the process and, and a vision planning session for everyone and how that can sometimes be hard if people aren't aware of say the financial structure of the town and how things have to operate in order um, to have a strong tax base. So the first study area we looked at was the old town hall. Um, very beautiful inside and in, uh, much of the historic nature has been preserved. So you can see the outside of the building and then addition on the left side and then the old chairs inside and the high ceilings. Um, you also can see the uh, second study area that we looked at, the old mill site and the river that abuts the property and some of the older buildings there. So for, first we'll look at the recommendations for our town hall site. I think Peter's gonna take that away. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Peter McNally. I work with the 195 uh, Commission in Providence. Nice to be here. Um, so we uh, segmented our recommendations in terms of you know short-term achievable things you can kind of get at right right away, and then some of the things the you know longer-term things. The longer-term or medium-term items, we're not suggesting you wait on those. They just will take a little while. They'll take a, a bit uh, longer uh, to um, you know achieve results uh, from. And I would, I would start out by saying you know we. Uh, there's no free lunch on this. This is this is going to be this is going to not easy. It's going to cost money, and it's going to not only take money. It's going to take focus and sort of an all-in approach if you want to get some 
uh, results uh, here. And I'll start off by some of the um, easier short-term fixes, uh, which will actually by no means aren't necessarily easy. But uh, one is like uh, clean up the building, you know, get it. Uh, the furniture we heard from Jen, you know, that some of that would be auctioned off. But you know, it'd be nice if by the summer it could be, you know, fully cleaned up, spotless, all the broken ceiling tiles taken down, lights flicked on, have the place spotless. And that will cost money. I mean, you know, we're not saying do be casual about it. Really sort of get at it. No wires hanging down, no dirty carpets. Get at it. Even though this building ultimately, any reuse inside, it will probably have to be gutted. But still, it's the perception you walk in. It's it's not it's not a good uh, it's not a good perception. So our recommendation is do that. Set some money aside and and get at that. Um, similarly, uh, one of the sources of pride for the town is the uh, Udor Tower, and um, we heard that you know several times from you know community uh, people, and uh, you know. Maintain it. Uh, it sounds like there are a few items. I didn't look closely at it, but there, it sounds like some of the steps and things you know could have a little. It could use some repair. And um, our recommendation is that's easy, uh, I, relatively easy. Get at it. Maybe put some up lighting on it, and um, that would help. Uh, one of the things we heard from other people is, is the town pride, and um, so we think that would be a, uh, an easy thing that would you'd immediately reap some benefits. And uh, similarly. Um, the river, one of the greater greatest uh, assets of the town, is um, you know it's overgrown with saplings and whatnot. So, you know, right on the riverbanks here by the side of the police station, um, you know, get a landscaper in there, get the trees and the saplings cut down, and get that cleaned up. Uh, it might be some good curb appeal and, and bang for that. And it's relatively cost money, but it's relatively easy to do. You could do it this year if you wanted to. Um, that not going to not going to be game changing, but it's 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 something we 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 think. Um, uh, longer term, or, and we recommend starting um, immediately, is you know get some funding together um, and uh, look at a feasibility uh, to redevelop the building. And we say feasibility. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the options uh, that you have uh, for the uh, building. Um, but to the extent it gets redeveloped, uh, there's, you know, as Ronnie mentioned, there's water and sewer. We've got to understand there are limitations there. It's not necessarily a problem, but there are limitations. So you might not be able to put a restaurant there. I don't know that a restaurant would be a great use of that, but if it were, which is important to understand that and getting some outside help uh, understanding uh, zoning, um, you know, code analysis, water, sewer, um, environmental concerns, and get a handle on the cost. I think the any redevelopment of that building, whether it's housing or commercial or just to prepare, you know, be ready for shock and awe. It will be a lot uh, to uh, re redevelop that uh, building. Um, the other thing is uh, on the medium term, and, we, and arguably the, you could do this more short term, is you know, pop up opportunities that link the bike trail uh, to the other site and here. Uh, you know, pop up can be food trucks, it could be a beer garden, um, it could be some retail camps. Those are things actually you could do now. It requires effort and often, sometimes requires money, but it's not a lot of money. And you could do that and it would sort of get some buzz going and it would allow for some experimentation uh, to sort of see what is desirable, what works. Um, and, and I will say, uh, I'll share an experience that we've had. I, and again, I work in Providence on the 195 land. And some of our issues are very different places. We're sort of in a city. This is a more rural community. Um, but where the 195 land is, is um, it's, it's really, people don't like me saying it, but it's an urban frontier. It's a fair amount of derelict land. And the state and the federal government spent $650 million sort of knocking down an old highway. And I think some people thought, well, miraculously, buildings are just going to sort of sprout up. And it's not, it's not that way. And um, so what we did on the pop-up side, this is a minor thing, again, not game-changing, but we ran an RFP process to have some food service, food trucks, um, and some uh, place-making activity. So we put together a little bit of money for it, we ran an RFP process, and it got, and what I learned um, on this land, in kind of really derelict, vacant, urban land, people showed up. 
uh, we do something every Friday night from April through end of October. We have food service. It, it, it's working. People get together. So I was very encouraged. I was pleasantly surprised and would encourage, you know, your team to you know, experiment with that. Doesn't doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's fun, and um, you'll make a few mistakes. Allow yourself to do that. So, but I think that would help uh, get things juices going um, ultimately on that site. Um, the uh, we evaluated what we thought were your options. It's, in some ways, it's easier to sort of know what you can't do there, but here are some things that you might be able to do, is consolidate your municipal uses um, into the building, the police, the library, the town hall, where we're right now. Um, and, uh, you know, extent, we, we heard uh, from Jen that, you know, longer term, uh, the police uh, department will need a new building. Well, maybe it goes in here. Here, I understand you're on a lease, so eventually, either you got to renew that lease or buy this building. Well, maybe you go back there. It's it's a, it's a thought, um, and uh, maybe uh, tie it in with a uh, community cafe or you know coffee shop or something uh, like that, um, and uh, you know get re reactivate the building, refurbish it. Again, not cheap, not easy, um, and uh, but. All of these uses, uh, the, hard, the hardest things for developers in sort of markets like this is who's going to occupy the building? Um, well, all of those uses there, other than the cafe, those are sort of tenants. They're going to have to go somewhere. So maybe, they be, maybe the town leaders decide that the best place is at this building. Um, another option is to uh, have the ha uh, building redeveloped uh, for affordable housing and maybe affordable senior housing uh, that would require a lot of uh, public support financially. And, um, uh, you know, we've, and we've heard that from the community today that, you know, providing housing affordable is something on your radar screen. It's, I don't know if it's the top objective, but it is an objective. I mean, in every, just about everybody, every community needs, needs affordable housing. Um, so that's an option. Nothing easy about it. Uh, but it's one thing, if it could get done, if it is deemed feasible, it's something that may not cost the town as much money. It would be the, the cost might be borne by others. So that's um, an option. And then the third option is to, you know, kick the can, not, not do anything. Um, it's, you know, not costing a lot. It's not, you know, it's, uh, I don't think anybody's happy about it. Um, but it is an option. And, um, and it would... Uh, I think we'd be doing all everyone a disservice to sort of say that that's not, you know, to, to not consider that as an option. So, any questions or move we'll on to the next? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Lagg. I'm the town planner for the town of East Ham out on the Cape. And just as a quick aside, I have the benefit of um, being on both sides of this process as a panel member. But East Ham had a TAP uh, program about a year ago, and we found it very useful, and it's uh, really provided some framework and guidance for everything we're doing in East Ham. So I commend uh, Millville for taking the step and having us here. So thank you. On the riverfront site, uh, again, uh, short, mid, long term, um, I think on the short term, there was pretty much total agreement on the panel that uh, step one has to be uh, get in there, complete the environmental assessments. I know um, you had Foss and O'Neill start on that process, but this site, um, there's a lot of variables, and it's really tough to figure out the direction until you really get in there, find out what the story is with, the, with any contamination or um, uh, what might be left over from the old mill operation days. So. Um, we just feel strongly that you have to allocate some funds, get some consultants in there, and just finish that, finish that job. Um, building off of that, or I guess really concurrently with that, is start to get in there, like at the other site, clean up the site, some visual enhancement, just start to get that um, curb appeal. And again, this is more on the, the non-environmental non side, but just, um, and this kind of goes on with the last um, bullet point, determine the environmental um, permitting, kind of the short-term part of that is start to find out what 
if you need to do anything with like local conservation commission jurisdiction, even just to um, open up the riverfront, do some pruning, cleaning up. Um, we understand that within the riverfront zone, so it probably is um, within conservation commission approval. So just kind of to-do list, short-term steps, start to line up all your eggs with um, the permitting. But I think cleaning up that site um, in the short term, just to get it uh, in the visual context of folks in town. They drive by, they see the site's cleaned up, it starts to get people's imaginations going and start to build on what might be possible there. Um, again, kind of a, a to-do list item short term, secure the building, um, you know, the old buildings, a couple of old building sites that are, you know, uh, derelict. We just felt, um, just from a liability standpoint, you should secure those. They're pretty much anyone could go in there and who knows what could happen. Um, so those are kind of, um, kind of relatively easy things you can start working on. Uh, Midterm things, um, again, just like the other site, um, I think our, our, our panel felt there was a lot of opportunities with these pop-up event um, options. Again, once the site's cleaned up, get some curb appeal, uh, just start to activate that site and get people's imaginations going. It's relatively uh, low, low cost, but if you can attract some food trucks in there, but also gathering spaces, just again, I think it really gets people's imaginations going and gets people onto the site. Mm -hmm. And I think if people realize it's, it is an asset, it's a wonderful asset, having that riverfront access and it's beautiful down there. And once the site's cleaned up, I think it'll really go a long way. And so again, these are short term, um, or, or you know, short term, mid term. These things could kind of happen concurrently. Um, but I think just having it, promoting it as an open space um, opportunity. Um, and then building off of that. So like we said, a lot hinges on the environmental assessment and where you go long term. But I think um, we had some ideas of if you could get in there and um, if it's sort of, if you were able to clean it up or got a clean bill of health, so to speak, um, repurposing the existing mill building. That's a, it's an interesting building. It's got a lot of character. Uh, it has its issues, but we kind of had, you know, our imagination started going, um, you know, even if you kept the shell of that building and it has it as an open air, put a pavilion top on it, stabilize the shell, had it as an open air community space. And we could easily see um, partnering with local businesses on, you know, through uh, you know, agreements with the selectmen to have, you know, pop up beer garden or share the space, arts and crafts fairs, if you can attract those kinds of things. We heard from the Chamber of Commerce folks that there is a pretty strong, um, you know, cultural art artist community in the, in the surrounding towns and they kind of collaborate on different event fairs and events. So I think if you can attract that, um, opportunities to Millville, and that's a great site. Um, and again, just long term, if you could utilize that, you, you know, that interesting architecture there. Um, and again, I think that with this site, it's, I think we kept going back to what are the opportunities as really not developing it out totally, but what are the open space opportunities and opening up the access to the river? And how can the adjacent properties that are already on your commercial Main Street, Center Street, kind of leverage off of that? So, you know, you can, it's not too hard to imagine folks coming down from the beautiful bike path, just a few hundred yards down, they turn in, you have this wonderful open space, food trucks, things going on. The businesses right adjacent, it might be viable that, oh, I want to I want to expand mine, or maybe I'll invest to open up the sandwich shop to build off the food truck. That kind of thing, I think, builds off of the, mom the momentum once you start to activate the site. But if you did want to consider um, some other non-open space, I think um, your zoning, you, you know, you could, it's, it's possible you could subdivide it um, into two lots. You do have an upland portion uh, closer to the railroad tracks where you could subdivide it. Um, possibly sell that off um, or do an RFP for private use. Again, a lot hinges on the environmental uh, issues there and what any kind of cleanup would entail. And um, again, option two, um, really just playing off of the, the public use. And I think, as I said before, I think there's a lot to consider with just the open space, the proximity to the riverfront, access to the riverfront. Um, and kind of small scale local businesses, what could you play off of that access? And then how does that um, help the adjacent business district go from there? So, okay. so for the action steps, 
Uh, Jamie had a great uh, way to phrase this earlier, which was uh, when we think of the next steps to, uh, to get into a development project, uh, it would be great for the town to think of the project as the town as the, uh, the developer or the uh, possible um, looking for investors. Um, so we wanted to take it back and say, okay, you have this opportunity. How does the town go out and find people that they think that would fit their vision and, and help with the economic development? So the first thing we wanted to recommend is to explore interlocal community development circuit rider. That's someone that will be able to understand the town's issues more so from a real estate perspective. Um, I think the town of Millville has a great staff already and we heard that today from the different stakeholders that a lot of uh, there's a lot of collaboration within the town and also um, some of the nearby communities. But having this interlocal person would help look at the the real estate specifically and understand how do you leverage that? How do you sell parcels off so you're maximizing your return? How do you, um, you know, redevelop in a way that's going to maximize your tax base? So this person could be potentially shared with the region, so um, Uxbridge or Minden ab above, and it also help save the town money. And also, you know, once again, bring all the town's um, staffers together in a way that maximizes everyone's skill set. The uh, next thing would be to obtain resources for civic capacity building. We heard today from some of the st stakeholders that I think it was called Proposition 2 um, that was voted down. And part of that, they believed, was because there was a misunderstanding of what it actually entailed and the understanding that taxes were needed to support some of the city's needs. Um, so we think with the civic capacity building, this will be able to engage all the town residents and have a more um, effective conversation around the needs of the town and how do you plan to best provide that. We think that you can look at various sources in the area and on the state level for technical assistance. So once again, the town doesn't um, necessarily have to pay for this this resource. And then uh, we suggested seeking funding um, for the CMPRC, uh, for the EPA, and that's for the environmental tests. Um, like some of my colleagues said, it's important to understand the environmental concerns at the site because that has a huge impact on what you can build. The next thing would be to obviously commission the environmental assessments once there was funding and to engage environmental council to help you navigate the process um, so you can be well informed of the different um, obstacles. The next part would be uh, to secure the buildings to reduce the liabilities and also to make it more marketable. Um, so if the buildings are secure and also the site is cleaned up, the town is always going to be ready for a, mar a possible marketing opportunity for a developer. So if someone comes in town and says, oh, I'm actually interested in the old town hall, you don't have to scramble to get things in place. You can just walk them right through. And it's easier for people to have a vision when it's a clean slate rather than thinking, you know, what if these chairs weren't here? What could I put here? So that's what we're trying to say with the marketing. And then also coordinate with the fire department um, for some of the concerns to make sure some of the buildings are, you know, X'd off so there's no fire concerns later on. Um, and then create a local state permitting and pre-permit strategy. Um, this is to understand, okay, if you are going to go through a development, how can you best get through this? We heard from some of the stakeholders that the permitting strategy can sometimes be confusing, um, but if the state is clear, or not the state, I'm sorry, the town is clear on the, the steps, it can help speed things up. Um, also, I want to note that by having a clear permitting um, idea for the town, this might help attract businesses and homeowners to other parts of the town, that which could also contribute to the tax base. So if people can move into the town easier, that's more money for the town. And then medium term um, is to finalize the development program. Um, and this is really taken into consideration the environmental concerns, the market, uh, the permitting. Once you have all that information, you can um, come to a determination of what would actually fit in the site and what's feasible. And we think that what's, whatever is developed at the site should have a local appeal and support. So having that conversation with the community is going to be crucial. You don't want to propose something that's going to be shot down at the next town meeting. Um, and then the city can issue an RFP. Uh, this would be a way for the city to um, craft what they're looking for and control what's at that site. Um, and also guide developers so that they have an idea. Um, with the clear scope in the RFP, you'll more likely get more developers because they know exactly what you're looking for. And then um, as you're issuing the RFP and waiting for responses, um, just to continue that um, placemaking at the site, 
these pop-up sites and activation with like lawn activities or the beer gardens are a great way to sell the site inadvertently. So if someone's at the site and they're like, wow, this is, there's a beer garden here. I could actually have a company here, you know, and it, it might click into them. Um, so that'd be a great opportunity. And then once the site is decided on what um, you want to go there and you have a developer in mind, we suggest wrapping up with a phase two of community engagement just to make sure everyone's on board with the final vision and the town's aware of the resources that are needed. So that's, you know, what staff uh, staffing do you need? Um, are there resources for funding the development? Is the town able to apply on a state level for funding to help match the, you know, the development needs? Mm -hmm. So it all would be helpful. And then marketing and placemaking is our third question. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lauren, and I'm with a communications firm up in Boston. So we look back at some of the media coverage on Melville, a lot of which most recently is about the rejection of the rise in the taxes. So I mean, I would just say from the get-go, don't underestimate the power of media and media coverage and kind of evaluate what reporters have written and who they've spoken to in the town, and is there an opportunity to get a list of residents who would more so advocate for the benefits of raising the taxes and you could do some sort of like letters to the editors or op-eds. There's a pretty meaty article on the Boston Globe which is obviously a well-read publication with a lot of reach and there's opportunities to tell positive stories about Melville like even just a story that students from Blackstone I think it was built this school like how can you further publicize that and then building this narrative and communications plan around a branded slogan like Melville on the Move was referenced in one of the more positive articles and building social media around that as well as a website and then I'm not sure if you're on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook but really trying to get a picture of are your residents there and if they're not can we use that to our advantage and encourage them to use it so as it links to the pop-ups is there a hashtag and a way to show people and even in the surrounding communities what Melville's all about. Um, and then to that point, and we'll get more into the pop-ups, I know we already mentioned them, but kind of assessing what's most popular and using social media as a tool to do that. So when you are in that RFI process, you kind of have those bullet points that are like, these many people attended this and that, and there's real data behind it. Okay. And I'll turn it over. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, it's, it's uh, Jeffrey Morrison Logan with VHB. It's, it's actually exciting to be back having presented to the board I think a month or two ago when we had our initial findings about what I call a lot of the physical constraints of these two uh, pieces of land which are, which are really wonderful assets that the town has here. And uh, knowing that you're like many other small communities trying to pivot from these assets and, and turn them into great um, you know, opportunities for your community is really challenging. So it's exciting to see the next steps start to get articulated tonight. So a little bit deeper dive onto some of these kind of placemaking opportunities here. We mentioned a lot about this idea of activating the downtown, not waiting for the bricks and mortar to come. You know, what are the things that you can do in the short term so that your community and perhaps the region can start to think of this as a place to go, you know, building upon what's already here today. So what are the Purpose, purposeful things that you're doing to almost rebrand, reposition your downtown to be the go-to place. So things like, you know, the social media um, uh, connections and building that social network, for example. The idea of understanding your community infrastructure through getting people to start talking about this place, talking about what the future of your riverfront's gonna be and your former town hall site. Get the excitement going and plan for some things like we have in the photos here, where it might be a small food truck event and even if it only has one or two food trucks, for example, the idea that I'm gonna to go to the heart of your downtown, your community, I'm gonna have an activity, and guess what? This is just phase one of what's gonna come later. Help us define what that phase two should look like to get the, that momentum going. So other ideas here, you know, what these pop-up events could be, um, there's a lot of great examples throughout the Commonwealth about where other communities have looked at, like things like beer gardens, food truck rodeos, uh, that have grown over time, doing arts festivals and community festivals, having your school as such a great resource and the, and the tech part of the school industry and celebrating those local success stories I think is quite important. 
um, and the idea that helping navigate so things like simple signage you know, to the downtown to tell people what you're going to see connecting it back up to the the trail for example in the seasonal use of that trail for example all of those things I think will uh, help you start to build momentum around this as a place to go. Um, as we're working through this as a team, this idea of just starting to visualize some of these improvements and where they would go, and if you think about your physical infrastructure here, this very simple diagram at the top has um, you know, some of your roadway infrastructure, the tracks that we have to come across Central Street as it comes down, up, up and down in the middle of the drawing there, obviously the blue with the river, and the lighter blue where you're your bike trail is today, this idea that these places are not so far apart from each other. And um, understanding things like, number one, putting something like a food truck or some information up at the, at the trailhead there and tr driving traffic towards your downtown and having more activities and getting people used to going to the heart of your downtown as you come off the trail would be a very important thing. A simple thing like putting some signage up, you know, Millville Town Center, a quarter mile away, come see XYZ and have some events and maybe a kiosk up there. Again, a pretty simple thing that we think you could do as well. And number three here, which is that dashed line on the bottom there, understanding that you're going to spend a million plus dollars um, as you're extending the roadway to the south towards um, Rhode Island, just getting ready for the, impact, the positive impact of that um, roadway infrastructure and the ability to connect to your neighbors to the south there, you should be thinking about the spin-off as aspects of those as well. And five, six, and seven, um, you know, we started talking about those, I think, a little bit earlier, that the idea, and on number five here is like the core of downtown, we're hoping through some of your marketing efforts, you might have a better vision for the heart of your downtown, just by reaching out and talking about it and getting into the, the local vernacular, like what you want that to be. Um, six are really the two sites here that I think really getting into the details about what those sites want to be. And seven is just thinking about your regional partners. So as you go up and down the valley, up and down the Blackstone, you know, there's a regional story to be told here. And we think the more you can be part of that regional story, even if it's a small way, that would really get you to the next steps. The last one here that's really more targeted, I think, to credit to the town and to your partners and the prior consultants that have worked on a lot of this great effort that led up to today's workshop, um, just understanding that those steps are very critical to the pre-development activities. So when you go to reach out to the development community, knowing that you've done a lot of this research, some of the environmental work, hopefully you'll have done the phase two work, some of the site constraints work, that information is very valuable when you're going out and asking the development community, please come invest here, tell us why, here, here's what we know about this site. Take away some of that mystery, I think that would be really helpful to them and understanding how you can leverage that. So we can imagine as part of your outreach, uh, maybe some website information, putting those as available resources as you're getting out there so that when you go out and you make this request from people to say, are you really have any interest in these sites? You can use that material to your, I think your advantage. And you can also let the um, development community come back to you and say like, well, now that I understand it, here's the things that we think you need to do to get that site further ready. Use it, really use it as a tool. That's what these are meant to be. And recognize lastly at the bullet here, there's a lot of great organizations that are out there that those networks exist throughout the Commonwealth, throughout New England and, and, and beyond. You know, getting familiar with those organizations and the networks that they have to be able to do a far reach into those developers in that community, you might find that there's developers that really want to be investing in communities like yours. So know where those are and, and how to get networked out to them as well. So with that, we'll go on to the funding sources. Who's up for this one? Claire, is that you? Yes, thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Claire O'Neill, I'm uh, with Mass Development. And thank you again for, for bringing everyone together today for us. Um, so, Obviously, you know, when, when we come up with these recommendations, then we are cognizant that there is a need to provide some funding and some help and assistance. And um, in, our, in our report, we will be looking at these and adding some additional ones and, and sort of expanding um, on why we think these are, are important. Um, right at the top, Mass Development Real Estate Technical Assistance Program. So um, your community is already um, accessed some of the, of, the, of the funds through this particular program in order to work with VHB and, and help um, sponsor the, the technical assistance panel today. However, um, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a good fund um, and we will be going out for a competitive round of applications um, probably in spring of 2019. So, um, you know, we should continue a conversation as to whether or not the community is ready to put in an application at that time for something such as the, um, the feasibility and code analysis of the old town hall site. Um, it, it will be a competitive round. There is a limited amount of money across the Commonwealth. Um, and I do think it's important that, that the community looks at some capacity constraints before um, requesting additional money like that. But, um, you know, I do want to maintain a relationship with the community and, and have a conversation about that as we move forward. Another source of funds um, for doing such feasibility analyses may actually be CDBG. Um, it, that, that may also be a way of exploring doing some uh, a planning grant opportunity with the Department of Housing and Community Development in Massachusetts. Um, so that is also something that we, we think is worth exploring. Um, with, the, with Jen's leadership over the past few years, you have, uh, you have got some MassWorks money in town, which I know that you're going to be using over the, the, the uh, next year or so in order to make those improvements that Jeffrey was talking about off of Central Street and down to Rhode Island. Um, but, you know, we want again for you to think long term about how MassWorks can be a, a partner um, with the long term redevelopment of, of these sites. Um, district improvement financing, if, if there were to be a large project um, that increased the, ta the tax revenue to the community, then it might be something that you want to consider. It's quite a, a complicated process, but it, what it does is it allows you to capture future revenue, future tax revenue, in order to make um, infrastructure improvements today. Um, so it, it might be something that um, would be a consideration, but not for a few years from now. It's not something you really need to think about right now. Um, one thing we talked about uh, today was how communities leverage a program called the Community Preservation Act. Um, obviously, in, in Millville right now, your priority is, is thinking about the stabilization um, of finances and sort of you've done a great job of bringing in a professional um, group and professional <coughs> assessment, assessments into the community. Um, so CPA is probably, again, not something that you want to think about over the next couple of years, but long term for a community like this with a lot of cultural and historical resources, it may be a, a, a good thing to think about. Um, mass development uh, has a number of um, ways of working with private developers, housing developers, manufacturers, nonprofits, in order to um, help facilitate both housing and industrial development and mixed use development. Um, so, you know, we, we can be a long-term partner for the community in thinking about how these um, projects might be funded. We also run a couple of programs, um, one of which is the Commonwealth Places program, which is um, whereby a community or a nonprofit raises funds in order to put infrastructure in place for things like pop-ups and beer gardens. And um, a great example of that might be the work that we've done with Ashland, where they have what's called the corner spot, um, where there is a pop-up um, coffee shop that comes in in the um, in the spring and the summer and the fall, um, so it helps people to understand whether or not there's a market for a longer term um, investment in a coffee shop or something like that. Um, so Commonwealth Places, what that does is uh, community raises some money locally, and then Mass Development provides a match, um, which you know obviously can, it can be up to fifty thousand um, dollars, but it's it's a nice way of leveraging your local funds in order to do a small project. Um, and what I also wanted to mention was we managed the state's Brownfields Redevelopment Fund. Um, the panel you know, strongly recommended that, um, that the community works with CMRPC to look at EPA funding for some additional environmental assessment. Um, what mass development might bring to the table in future years is some assistance with either remediation by the town or remediation by a developer. Um, as part of a, a larger project. Um, but we have those resources as well. Am I missing anything? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ronnie. Thank you. And next part is questions. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Before we go into questions, I just want to take time to thank Sarah Marsh, who is on our team, that really put this whole thing together. So I want to publicly acknowledge her and also just tell the community that we know some of the things that you have to tackle will be challenging, but we do believe that Millville is on the move and that we will, that we're here to help you um, really fulfill your vision. So thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you for, for all your effort uh, and all the work you put into this, uh, this day. And we enjoyed having you and uh, being able to talk about our town. Um, it's a little overwhelming, overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> at this moment uh, in that, uh, you know, we're, we're still in a financial crunch. We're working to get out of it. Uh, and uh, what we do need is some strong planning and uh, setting a plan, of course, going forward. That's all I have to say. I don't think it's just planning. I think it, it is, well, I guess it is. But <laughs> with that said, we have to look out of the box. We need to look forward, not just plan forward, but be able to see forward as well. Um, Right now, we do have some very, very tough circumstances that we're working within. But we can't look back and look at the mistakes. We need to look ahead to see, to keep Millville on the move. And that's where people, we need to market ourselves better to get the people to buy in to make it happen. I think you, you said it very well. So I greatly appreciate you being here and the time you spent today. I thank uh, Jennifer Callahan, a former town administrator, for working to get this ha to happen so that we can have this, this forethought um, in bringing Millville to where it can be. Yeah. People, if the town needs to stop look, thinking about the things we may have lost or the things that might have gone wrong, and let's look forward and how do we change that. And I think some great ideas have been brought out tonight. We, we have to change the mindset. <coughs> yeah. And mindset is everything, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I got out of this is you need some energy and some people with areas of expertise that you brought to light tonight that have not shown themselves in, in the town till this point or to this point in time. They may be sitting out there waiting for the opportunity. Um, not just an opportunity, but perhaps an invitation. Right. And at least now we have some ideas as to what has worked in the past. I think a lot of our time as we sit at this table is how are we going to pay the bills when we have somebody who may be in a bit, I know for sure there is a food truck business that runs out of this town. Wouldn't it be wonderful for him on or her on their downtime to be able to set up maybe you're on a little extra money and then we can put it in somewhere in the newspaper or local area uh, free newspaper even better you know and that's just an example it's not doesn't mean that that's what it has to be but those are some things that instead of thinking about how we're going to pay for things we can also think of um, a, a couple things. I think one of the things that I did get out of here, and, and, and it's interesting because as we are looking at the daunting task of repurposing an, an older building uh, and also looking at, you know, something that's been vacant that people don't even really know exists, um, you did bring to light about the marketing, and I think that's really important, that that's a, that's a piece of the strategy for attracting developers. And I think, you know, people may try to... Um, say, you know, poo-poo the aspect of doing this pop-up stuff, but I understand pretty clear where you're coming from that, that mm -hmm. developers want to come to a community that is vibrant, right. and you want to plant the seeds for the vision. So my question back to you is, is uh, one, especially with uh, the vacant uh, lot that's, you know, about 10 acres uh, and has that, you know, 
history, and we know that we talked about securing um, for small money, I think, you know, uh, around those vacant buildings and clearing the area could offer, you know, a, a much better visual. Uh, but my, my question is, uh, you know, with the end goal that that is not to be just a definitive open lot for food truck businesses. I don't want anybody going out of here thinking that. I don't, because I know what you're, you're trying to do. But it is to get the uh, community support, but more importantly, the eyes of developers. So th the question I have is that oftentimes communities will put together visioning boards. Um, and also, I know you say fe feasibility, but that sounds like a very long-term thing when you don't want to necessarily put a lot of money into a feasibility study for something that one, the community doesn't support, two, that some developer might want to do something completely different. So what's your experience level with, you know, using funding to really bring, and I think, Jeff, you, you started that with the VHB study about the constraints of the two sites and all of that, but really creating some visioning boards uh, that relate to the repurposing of both spots, um, you know, and I, when I say boards, you know what I'm saying. It's not just that, you know, architecturally having visions for the community to not just use to increase the energy level of the community towards the forward thinking for possible uh, repurposing and economic development, but more importantly also, you know, act as a springboard for somebody we want to bring in to entice them to come to Millville to do something. You know, how, how, you know, I just know my experience in the Chamber of Commerce in the past was, you know, if you, if you show it um, or if you design it or if you can articulate it, they'll understand it better. Right. Sure. I think, I think there's uh, many examples out there where there's sites like this that don't have development on it that are waiting for the next step to happen, where they'll take pieces of all the work that I think we've seen over the last few days, yeah. package that into maybe a, a trifold onto a couple of boards, into a flyer mm -hmm. that would have things like what are the demographics, what are the population, how big is the site, mm -hmm. what funding sources might be available, has your community vision for the site or not, just to let people know if there's some buy-in locally or not, what is it zoned for, and I think from all the documents that we've seen here, you have all, I think, a lot of those ingredients, mm -hmm. I think it's just an effort of like packaging it in a way, developing that collateral and making sure you're reaching out to the organization that we talked about to kind of get the word out there as, as well. And I think the next step would be what happens if you get a phone call, right? So like, are you ready to deal with like those next steps too? So get that collateral ready, but also know what your game plan is when you hopefully get some of those calls or if they come with questions, how do you get some of those questions answered too? That's not hard to do either. It's just knowing who to share that information with. That's right. Yeah, but I would so sort of say, you know, we tried to make a point to that, um, to yeah, stand up, yeah. 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 The, you know, it's marketing this mm -hmm. or enticing somebody is probably kind of letting us off easy. It's not. It's not going to be that easy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not that you're saying. But it's a start. But I think the, actually, what we argue is that you got to start with the environmental stuff because mm -hmm. if you get somebody actually who was dying to come here, it's mm -hmm. not going to go anywhere until those underground storage tanks are dealt with. And that with, if you started tomorrow. It, that takes a long time. It's a highly regulated kind of type of thing. It might not be that bad, um, but it will be money, it will be grants, and it will take some time to sort of get that kind of clean bill of health. Uh, so that's, you know, that will take not only some money, but it will take, you know, some sustained focus uh, to, to, get, to get to that point. So, Can I ask your opinion on something? When we were walking around in the old town hall, Peter, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I heard you throw a number out, which I thought was fairly realistic as, as to dollars per square foot to rehab that building. And um, I want to know from your experience if you think the shell of that building is worth putting that kind of money into versus spending the same amount of money on a new building on that site to attract a developer or a, an end use for the town? Well, I don't think it will be for a municipal building. I don't think it will be terribly different, new or, or renovated. And I think that's going to be kind of for you all to answer, not for us. Um, and, I, and when I sort of casually threw out a number, uh, I was basically in a 10,000 square feet, $300 a square foot. You know, kind of like real. I've been around enough in the business. It's, it's, 
probably not going to be any less. It's a, you know, it's a municipal building. There's limited corners you can cut. It's going to be handicapped accessible. It's going to have new HVAC, all that stuff. Um, it's it's not going to be less, and it might be a little more. No, so, I know from experience, so, it was a pretty realistic number. If nothing, it was a low number. Yeah. So based on that, yeah. is it with with the constraints of that building when it's all done and you've spent that kind of money on it? In your opinion, would we be better off or at least considering the option of demolishing the building and spending the leftover on something that's more uh, adaptable to multiple uses or, or an individual development plan? Well, and I'm not trying to be elusive uh, answering your question, um, but I actually do think it's for you guys to answer. And I would encourage you to in study any and all options. And that's, you know, we're trying to do. And we're trying to kind of keep the list narrow. I mean, there's not endless options. Yeah. You know, right. it, and, the, and there's certainly very limited options for private development to come in. That, that's very limited. So, which is another way of saying, you guys are off, you, you're on the hook for this one. You know what I mean? Um, one way or the other. And so I, what I don't fully understand is how much civic pride and um, attachment there is for that building. You know, some of these buildings are important. Um, to the psyche, and it looks like it's a functional building. It's 10,000 feet, two floors. I, I don't know what you would gain by tearing it down and building. You might gain a lot. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know how important is that? Uh, you know, lo location mm -hmm. in the in the in the history. Um, but that's, you, you know, I, 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 you know, we came to it saying, okay. The demand, you do have these user groups. You have a police department. You have the town hall. You have the, you know, there's the, the, um, the library. I, I, and we, we didn't really know how much sense it made to kind of consolidate these. The, the, so, but they're there. They got to go somewhere, and it costs money. It co you know, it doesn't cost 300 bucks a foot to do this space, but you know, you don't own the building either. Um, the other thing too is, as you get into the feasibility, and when we say the feasibility. Um, would like to sort of say, I think there's probably a little fatigue from you guys from too many studies, and you get studied, mm -hmm. more studies, and then we come in and recommend more studies. Right? But when I say, when we were using the term feasibility, we're actually sort of getting it to the next level, like, okay, what can you do and what can't you do? So we can talk about a restaurant up there if we thought that was a good idea and you thought it was a good idea and there was demand for it, but we find out that the septic can't handle it. Well, there's no point in doing that, right? Um, and I think the feasibility could, you know, curb cuts and some of those things. And if you, when uh, Ronnie or Jeff were talking about getting a fact sheet together, it, I'm, I'm making this up, but if you need the abutters approval to put a curb cut and they're going to say no, then what's the point? You know what I mean? You, you try to get those covered off before you get to it. To that level. So. Yeah. And to follow up that, it's kind of like you have to know everything that you're working with. So you have to know what the environmental conditions are, what the permitting constraints are, historic, um, how much will it cost to renovate the old building. Once you get that number, then you can go, you know, is it better to renovate or to, to demolish and start over? Um, you also need to know can you demolish based on the historical significance of it? You might be forced to work with that building because. You, you have to. Um, so you kind of have to know, and that's what we're saying within the feasibility study, there's a lot there that we just can't give you an answer. Um, but once you can get all the information in front of you, also the market demand, that will help you come to the final like development scenarios. And that's why we think the person, um, the inner uh, community um, circuit person will be great helping with that to understand all of the, the real estate impacts of it and the environmental concerns, water sewage funding. I'm sure that's not the answer you wanted, but that's... No, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's better to be up front than, yeah. than not. Mm -hmm. I also want to just encourage you to give yourself permission to have a win. Um, and we're talking about some really heavy circumstances as it relates to the repositioning of these two properties. However, you know, um, the committee was very intentional about talking about other ways that you can access them, particularly the old town hall site. And so while I understand that you brought us here to really focus in on the repositioning of these two properties, you know, d don't take for granted the other things that we recommended because it will boost the morality of your, your board 
the community that's here if they can see something moving. So we tried to make sure that the recommendations that we gave you were very action oriented because you know we, we saw the studies, we read them, and quite frankly, we're not telling you new information, but rather trying to position you to be able to take action on the extensive information that you have already. So I just want to really emphasize that please give yourself permission to have a both and approach to this. Um, and I think it would position you to be <coughs> successful in your endeavors. Um, any of the town residents here, Ken or Jerry? Or Mr. Just one Finn? question. Uh, um, we've done a study. We've looked at the, uh, the building, the uh, old town hall. We've got a, uh, what now is probably what two or three years ago. Uh, we know what it's going to cost. It was about four million, um, and I'm sure that hasn't gone down since uh, two years ago. Uh, and it was just out of question for the a budget of at that time five and a half million. Um, we've got some issues with that building that go well beyond um, whether it even could be repaired. Um, there's some things in that building with burnt uh, superstructure. There's some uh, pillars that have actually moved off the foundation. The building is actually sagging this way. Uh, it's got some, uh, we didn't get kicked out of there because it was in good shape. Um, that, that building is in dire straits. Um, and it's concerning because it, it, it eventually we had to get people out of there because of the safety reasons. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know what that, and I, I like your answer. I, I think it needs to get knocked out. <coughs> because if it's not, it's going to fall into the police station. Mm -hmm. We did a plumb line from the roof. We dropped it down, and we were like, what? Six inches. Six no. inches off and plumb. Inch and three quarters on the police station side. Mm -hmm. Three and a half inches on, yeah. on the 122 So we've side. got some concerns. That whole thing is starting to sag this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's, it's going on. Yeah. Like yeah. They did that a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming off its pillars, right? The, the, the actual... They, they, well, they at some off. point, there's broken masonry joints in there. So we, we've got some, and I'm not trying to discourage this. I'm just saying, I almost think it's better to knock it down. Yeah. Because I, it, it would take an enormous, we'd take the entire roof off to be able to fix the burnt uh, structure that's up there. Yeah, it, it almost doesn't make sense, okay? But I guess my, my overriding question is, I just want to let you know about, we've done some of those things. The other uh, question I really got is, uh, where are we without sewer and water tower. I mean, I, to me, it almost seems like that's a, and I understand the environmental impact, absolutely, that's gonna happen first or else all bets are off if you're, you're 21E and you find out that you are just loaded with all kinds of chemicals, what are you gonna do with it? But the idea is if we don't get bring water or sewer in, what are we gonna do in town? What is the town going to accomplish? If I was to take that building and repurpose it and put in, you know, senior housing, how are we gonna do that? We don't have any water, we don't have any sewer. It, I mean, it can be done. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. The, the question is just, you know, for the cost of the project, do you have the ability in the market to, to finance yeah. all that infrastructure? And if not, how do you fill that gap? Mm -hmm. um, but you would not be the first community to take on, say, a multifamily reuse of a building like that. Um, excuse me, sorry. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't be the first community in Massachusetts to <coughs> to take a piece of municipal property, yep. try to do a multifamily reuse of it where there's no water and sewer. I mean, it has been done. But I would say this, you know, if I'm a developer and I'm looking for an opportunity in a region yeah. to do housing or a commercial project in three different places, Why would I'm, you know, if I can go to a place that has this infrastructure that's construction ready mm -hmm. versus one that's not, I think you have a competitive weakness. I think that's the issue. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Not that something is inherently infeasible, but rather your ability to compete yeah. is weakened. Right. So if that is the case, I, I would ask the question, how important would you folks feel that bringing water and sewer into the main mm -hmm. center of town would help in the reconstruction of businesses and the advent of bringing people into town so we can do some of the things? I love the ideas you're talking about. I think it's great. I think the river is a tremendous asset that we could take advantage of and maybe do some hydro things off it or something. But without sewer water, we're, we're really kind of, we're kind of hands are tied behind our back. It's you know, I, I hear you. I, I don't feel that I have enough information to give you a definitive answer. Um, I, I, I don't know that it's a deal breaker, but I think it's a, it's an impediment. So there are, I mean, there's the answer I can give you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, Bill, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we might be on the same line, but I was going to go, I'll let you speak first because you haven't um, had that opportunity. The, the thing is that you may not have considered is that you really have some pretty intense uses there mm -hmm. already. So, you, you know, you have the school, you have the police, you have a couple of apartments. If you say you're going to raise those or, you know, at some point you're going to raise part of them, you still have that capacity, whatever waste treatment facility you're, you're using for the school you could, or the town hall, you could use it for a new use. Right. Um, so that was one of the feasibility mm -hmm. issues we, we suggest you look at mm -hmm. is, you know, where are you getting your water from now to service the existing yeah. units and then what are your options? So you could put in like a restaurant, presumably, right. maybe a pretty big restaurant. Mm -hmm you know, using that capacity. Well, Menden doesn't have sewer or water. Mm -hmm. And then you have this huge motor vehicle, new motor vehicle complex, Imperial Motors. I don't know how many. Um, it's got plenty of this. So. It's got plenty of money, but, but they don't have sewer and water. They have, and there's a restaurant and a number of other things that yeah, site. Yeah, the zoo. And I, and I also think. I think you can make yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think you can make money in that market. You'll do it. Then all of a sudden, the lack of infrastructure or the limitations of infrastructure means something very different. Uh -huh. That's, I think, the question that's hard to wrestle with here. Right. So, and I think there's another piece of it. It's that we think of sewer in its traditional form, that it's coming already. There's a treatment facility, you know, even if it's in another town, like, you know, Blackstone and that you know you want to link something and we know it's going to be millions of dollars to try to link it to where you want it um, You know even in the community that I live uh, You know they had a big school addition that they wanted to do and they didn't have sewer But they have hundreds and hundreds of students and they had to decide to put their own on-site package treatment facility I don't necessarily think that in terms of the old town hall because the old town hall does have a functioning septic system and it has worked for many years with a lot of the variety of um, influxes of the number of people going in and out of that building. It's the riverfront property that doesn't have any infrastructure right now, but that is like a place that could actually do, uh, you know, a smaller on-site package treatment um, facility uh, that that exclusive to that area. Um, that's something that hasn't been looked at in terms of a feasibility study. Uh, we just keep saying, well, we don't have water or sewer. But that's something that's not out of the question. Um, but it's a key issue that needs to be It does. And because, I, right. Because the, the question is just, if I'm going to do a project, it's going to cost a certain amount to right. do it. Yeah. And then in this market, this is what I can expect to take in. Right. Do I have a gap? So that's where the town comes in, though. So if the town has the land and wants to attract and can go after money that is there for doing, you know, mm -hmm. sewer rate relief stuff, we have not done that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're just constantly looking at people's, you know, tight tanks in town and stuff like that. I think that is a possibility to really explore what would that right. cost and could but the that's town... That's right, why we're right. saying the yep. feasibility study sure. is really just terribly important. You know, one of the things we talked about, too, for the town hall site, mm -hmm. because there is existing infrastructure there to support that building, is if you want to try to preserve that in some way, um, I think an obvious thing to look at is something like multifamily housing, which you could then leverage low-income housing tax credits, because that's been done in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The ability to, that, bring, that closes a gap in a development pro forma. And so it gives you some housing, it gives you a reuse of the building, it helps to save the building. If the building can be saved, you know, I'm not commenting right now on mm -hmm. the structural issues yeah. with the building, but l let's say that you can can save it, but there's a gap, then if you're not going to go back there for municipal purposes, that's kind of an obvious consideration would be redeveloping it for housing. That has been done um, to be able to pair low-income housing tax credits with historic tax credits that's being done in Southbridge right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so this, these are kind of options that are available, but what I think you really need, and the thing that I kept thinking the whole time I was listening to all the conversation today was, you guys need internal capacity to pull this together. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, not, it's not only a town administrator, it's not only a town planner, it's a, it's a community development practitioner, it's somebody who kind of knows the real estate way to pull these things together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that circuit rider recommendation was coming yeah. from. You're a really small town, so for you to have a community development person full-time doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. But you have communities around you that could 
and you're already doing wonderful things with interlocal agreements so to be able to build on that experience and say we've all got issues in our communities that are sort of market driven or market constrained that are bigger than us how do we get that kind of expertise in our communities in a way that's going to be efficient for us i think that's something you need to look at no, I think that's actually excellent because some of the best things that have happened in this town, especially in the last two and a half years, have required the town to actually bring in experts from the right. outside yeah, because sure. we didn't have that internal capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's led to us doing a lot of things that we never would have even thought of or achieved. Mm -hmm. And and then also leveraging the, the existing, you know, talent that we do have sure. in town and in gen, uh, energizing that. And so, you know, that step of, you know, getting a person who can help us with those next steps it's you know in the financial constraints it's hard to think about that but at the same time you know it was hard to think about how are we going to do you know technology infrastructure in this town how are we going to actually look at some of the things that we've tackled head-on um, through the great technical assistance including stuff like this today and that's something that we you know despite the financial constraints that we're in the process of doing so I think that's an excellent you know way to visualize again another uh, technical um, expert that can help the town do that because it requires a lot of work. I mean, when you're but an on site in, right. or you know somewhat on site right. presence, it's it's having the person to do the task. You know, I I do a lot of planning work. I'm actually come from the community development background, so this is near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that's kind of sad for a town like yours is you're doing all this planning work and you're trying to get somewhere, but just having the people, the capacity. I keep calling it capacity. The, human capacity to get the job done. That's where things hit the wall. That's, I think, the thing that you really have got to look at here is how you fill that gap. If you can fill that gap, a lot of these other gaps, in one way or another, will be filled, perhaps beyond ways that we can envision in this room tonight. Oh, I think that's good. Just thinking, I don't know if changing either the charge of the groups that maybe already exist uh, and so spreading the, the wealth or well, one of the t things that the board did do early in, in our infancy of starting to work with the um, CMRPC um, in particular was that we started conceiving of a community development block grant in the, mm -hmm. the future and um, we had voted as a, a board to actually establish a community development committee you know to look at mm -hmm. this the thing is is that you know of course you <laughs> there were a lot of other things that happened sure. and and we needed to focus our grant energy um, on things that uh, were going to be very meaningful to this town um, in making this huge transition over here, including the infrastructure that you talked about, a technological infrastructure from, um, you know, enhancing our website. And that's actually very close to being completed. Uh, but it was another thing that would not have been possible if we hadn't gotten the technology grant that we leveraged for the next four years. So the town financially can handle that because it's already been, you know, um, done. And and it paid for um, but it's now actually the implementation so but but it's using those kind of resources and I think it's the same thing here um, that you know we we have some that hasn't been energized at the next level mm -hmm. but that's why this was important because it's it's easy to get sidetracked by all of the other things that are happening without looking at the next the next steps and so some of the stuff that you've recommended tonight I think are you know ways to really start to conceptualize the next pieces of this um, and not have all all of the um, the the answers to it right out right off the bat I, can I ask one question about the environmental study so you guys looked at it a lot more closely than and it was done before I had um, you know come here as a town administrator for anybody who's really uh, I don't know if that's Jeff um, or anybody that can uh, answer that when you talk about that next phase I thought it was a pretty comprehensive study that from other you know studies that had been done did not show some of the real alarming issues that a lot of old older mill sites have um, where it, you know all the alarm bells go off so I don't know if um, you know it doesn't have to be tonight but if the if somebody in the group with the environmental expertise could say okay this is exactly what I would recommend next I know we say environmental assessment I just I don't want to duplicate you know stuff that's already been done because the town can't afford it for the time and and the resources so I don't know about you know you Jeff you can answer that question so I think um, independent of the specifics that were in the phase one report um, you know this, this is a phase two uh, step that, that, that um, sites usually go through 
And that's really about like the action plan, like really answering some of the unknown questions that come out of the phase one, getting okay. into the action plan. There's, there's LSPs that are usually involved in doing the environmental assessment, have to be licensed to be able to do that type okay. of work. I think as you saw in the presentation, I think one of the bullets talked about as a town, seeing as you're the owners of that site, understanding what those next steps mean for you as a, as a community and understanding a strategy around getting through that whole environmental cleanup process mm -hmm. and engaging that right type of council and right type of licensed expert to get you there. But think about it as you have a general characterization yeah. of the things that are out there, but you don't have a plan on what to do with it yet. Okay. So it's kind of developing that plan. So that was a big study. That's right. Yeah. I was like glazing over as I was going back to my old, you know, right. chemistry days and everything else trying right. to make sense of it. But, but this idea of developing the plan of attack and understanding the implications, the cost, and, and your responsibilities as you go through that as well. So I think that's a critical next step so that you're not kind of, not that you're not guessing, but like not knowing what to do next and how to maybe divide and conquer or work through those steps for permitting and understanding the timing to the market because these things might take mm -hmm. a lot of time to right. be able to get the site ready to be able to do that step. So that next step is a pretty critical one. Okay. Yeah, engage the professionals to help you really get there. Another way of looking at it is, uh, so I'm not an engineer, so more of a, an investor. And every state has a little different regulatory regime, but they're all similar in, some, in the same way. And uh, what you want is regulatory closure, right? right? Mm -hmm. okay. And I just sort of skip down to page 19 of the Fuss on the Airport, underground storage tanks, talk to people at the fire department. Usually fire departments regulate mm -hmm. uh, underground storage tanks, right? They, they know when they were put in in 1958, there were permits. Um, and here, in this case, just you can read it yourself, the Fuss on the Airport said, you know, they, they didn't have clear records. Okay, so, you know, it's an industrialized site. There's probably issues. Maybe not, right? right? So. Um, our thing is like that there's not to overwhelm you it's in fact trying to do the opposite just just get at it you know get get re-engaged by well I'll help you with it, right get fuss on the deal get, need a lawyer and take it one step at a time okay you're not signing up for anybody but, you, but you, we can do all the aspirational kind of visioning and thing, mm -hmm. but it will not matter one bit with it. I don't even know that you can put a beer garden out there mm -hmm. or something. Right. But, uh, by the way, right. 195, it's already been cleaned. It's kind of, but it, you know, it needs a cap, you know, some clean fill on top. And the Department of Environmental Management, they kind of give us a hard time when we have like the marathon or a road race right. stop on a thing, you know. I mean, it's absurd, mm -hmm. but they are a regulatory agency. You know, in this case, actually, there is evidence of potential things. So anyway, it's... Listen, they've got soccer fields on top of, d of prior landfills. What's that? They're building soccer fields and stuff on top of prior landfills, you know, with, with, with the guidance from things like that. So the perspective has changed on repurposing. this, it's going to, it will, even if you have a best case scenario and it's not a lot of money, and there's, by the way, there's money out there, the EPA, you know, but even if, um, you got a best case scenario. It's just going to be time. No one, you, no one's going to be able to build a building on that tomorrow. It's going to be a couple of years, and you may as well get at it. And by the way, it is satisfying. I haven't been through a, a number of these over the years. It is satisfying. You do get there, but it takes a while, and you need focus. And I think some of the other we talk as a group a lot about um, all of this stuff is is overwhelming. You know, we're trying to put ourselves in your shoes, <clears throat> and some of the uh, pop up stuff that we were talking about. Um, it's sort of like you can kind of get it now. Even that's not, somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. You know, if you have a beer garden, I don't know, I was, I don't know what it is in Massachusetts, but you need a catering license or a liquor license, yeah. but yeah. somebody's got to kind of, and if you can't do that, you definitely can't build a big building there, right? You know, so it's sort of like, try that, see how that goes. It's great community building thing. Yeah. You get a few wins, right. it's uh, fun. It's you visible. make a few mistakes, yeah. you haven't blown a ton of money. <laughs> like, no one gets hurt, all right? Yeah. And, um, and in that vein, it's sort of like that environmental, don't get overwhelmed by it, just yeah. piece by piece, right? You got fussing on the other, you know, I've actually worked with them personally, you know, they're, they're, they're doing it. And you can just get started one step at a time. You got help. We'll, we'll, we'll help you with that. Okay. Uh, but anyway. No, thank you. It's <sighs> important. Yeah, I have a question. Having been involved in Millville for a long time and several other organizations in the community, I heard the word marketing multiple times tonight. How do you market the town to encourage citizens to come forward and volunteer their time and get involved in some of these things? That's one of the most difficult things to do 
-hmm. is engage people in the community, yep. get them off the mm -hmm. couch, and down here to participate. Mm -hmm. And the more that do, mm -hmm. the more that seem to want to come in. But it's a very tough road yeah. today yeah. with people's lifestyles. Um, well, I think one of the most simple ways to go about it is obviously social media, which there's no cost behind it, but you do need someone dedicated to monitoring it and uploading the content and spreading the word, word excuse me, and building a follower base. But if there's an event, it's pretty simple. It's just like uploading a photo with a caption, with a clear direction and call to action, getting people to opt in. Like, you know, Melville residents, post your favorite photo from the bike trail and we'll feature it on our Instagram. Just things like that. And then other towns are seeing what you're doing. It's like real estate's also a very visual industry. So the more you can encourage those images, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I would say that's the easiest, like most simple fix and a quick fix to go about it. Um, I did take a quick look at the Instagram. It seems like there's some followers, but no posts. And then the Facebook, there's a town of Melville Facebook, but there's, there's not really a directive behind it. It's just people posting kind of like their thoughts. So a more proactive strategy about how to approach all those social media channels and mm -hmm. what you're really trying to accomplish. So, you know, in in um, after the town started to decide that we we're going to move away from the, the existing website and found the money to be able to have that website being developed and ready to, to go with it, uh, we have what we call Millville Mattis, which is something I didn't bring up and I don't know if it came up, but we have one of our active um, board members have you know, been the sort of brainchild behind that, and that has actually acted as a real surrogate mm -hmm. for the community to get you know, participation into. But it's one of those things um, that you have to make sure of that you will connect even as the regular town entity, because if someone's looking you know, for the official town piece, they, they may not, they might miss that. But mm -hmm. that has a lot of energy um, yeah. and, and follow um, from the town, and, and it is used very frequently mm -hmm. for all kinds of things. So, but I, I think that whole piece about the social marketing, we recognized that, I did, and said that's why we need this new website. But like anything, you know, registering and getting it developed and then, you know, um, if you work with, and we work with vir uh, virtual towns and schools, but then that's changed to civic, um, civic government. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it delayed some of that, what, what we wanted to have done. But yeah, I think it's a good point. You got to be able to communicate, share that, and also create the images that you want for the visualization for developers of any sort to, to think about the community and, and the pride that he's talking about to generate people to participate. And another thing we talked about was being creative about your resources. Is there an intern at a nearby college mm -hmm. who could easily do that if they're studying communication? A vocational technical school. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is kind of more of a statement or maybe even a recap. I'm sorry, I don't recall your name. Monika. Monika. Yes. I think we need to take your statement <clears throat> and allow ourselves some successes, no, ma no matter how big. From that, we'll build more successes and get, hopefully, I think this is a theory, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we'll get more people who maybe want to participate and have successes of their own within our town. Mm -hmm. And from that, we build to the next level. Mm -hmm. is, is, am I on the right track with that? Yes, and I'll just, um, just stand up. In addition to my work at the Urban Land Institute, I am also a public leader. Um, um, I serve in the city of Cambridge, and we grapple with, you know, how do you, how do you engage citizens about getting more involved? And you're absolutely right. People work multiple jobs, they have children, and even if they don't, they have other things they want to do with their time than sit in a public meeting. And sometimes they can be snoozers, just to be very honest. <laughs> so I get that aspect of it, and I think that being creative around how you leverage your time and choosing one thing that you can gather people around and reimagining how you even leverage your town staff to be able to en engage um, the community and leveraging their time in different ways around one initiative or one thing that then leads to the next thing. So I think you just need to give yourself permission to reimagine how you leverage time here and identify what that one thing will be that will then build off of what you just said will lead to the next thing. Thank you, Monique. 
Monica, um, I know you, you, we were trying to look at a time period, but um, I thought I would ask um, Ken Tubman, who actually participated as one of our stakeholders today as part of our business community, if you had anything that you wanted to um, say about the experience or question, I didn't want to not have you as part of that. He also serves on our finance committee, which is great, but um, he came as a, an entrepreneur, and um, you know, if you wanted to express anything, I think it would be helpful to the town so that they understand that kind of excitement that you feel um, as a member who not only serves on a board but as somebody who's an entrepreneur and has done some successful businesses yourself already that I don't think everybody is aware of you know sure well thanks thanks for everybody coming today I, I thought this was great and I, I thought it opened up a great dialogue he wants you to come to the mic I'm sorry thank you Tim I didn't even hear him. <laughs> the man behind the door pay all attention to him because he knows what what to do so uh, yeah, no, this is this was a great great uh, dialogue today, and I only got to sit through just that you know hour today earlier today with the um, uh, kind of stakeholder meeting. Um, some of the things that I, I kind of heard today, and I think it was Jeffrey that asked the question, is you know what is our identity for the town? And I, I thought that was a great question of you know what what is it that we want to be known for? Because that kind of defines you know what steps and actions that we do take. Uh, so that was one huge takeaway for me. Uh, and then your final point, Monika, is really, um, is it, it does start with a step, right? So I, I think, you know, as we think forward, you know, as a town, you know, it, it, it's, it's got to start somewhere, right? So if we start at the point of, you know, saying, hey, let's define a five-year plan, right? And maybe in that five-year plan, we don't do much, right? But mm -hmm. we do have a couple of things that we do do. So those are just the final points I want to put out there. Thank you. Right, and I think some of the action steps you did give us and some of the other follow-up is, is no different than how we got here today. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like the town hasn't been active and the board hasn't really wanted to be active because you wouldn't be here today for us if we hadn't already started that process. Mm -hmm. The Municipal Building Relocation uh, Committee got us here to this building. Mm -hmm to no cost to the taxpayers. Um, so think about that, you know, uh, the town can be resourceful, sometimes to the, to the point where people just think these things are happening. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, some people will say, oh, we don't have money for that. And I'm like, we're not actually, you know, on the hook for some of this stuff because the town has been very forward thinking and putting the next action step. So this is part of our next action step. We knew that we needed that next, you know, bit of really good technical experience um, and insight and some ideas that were fresh about both sites and um, and again you know it's easy just to drive by the old town hall and also the other property where people don't even know it exists and and not even you know thinking about it because you just well that's the old town hall but you got to get to that next step and that's why you're here today so I want to say um, thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions, but I did tell Monica we would try to keep it. Some people have some long commutes. It's You've been, been here since very day. early in the morning. <laughs> You've been on the Millville Senior Van. You've been around town. You've seen some great things, and uh, I think you provided us with yeah. something great. And I don't know, Joe, if you want to give some closing as the chairman of the board. Well, I really appreciate the professionalism of, of your group. It's it, it's right on, spot on, as I would say, and uh, and I really, really thank you for all your effort, uh, in all coming together and giving us a little boost up to the next level. I you know. Thank you. Thank you. And I would be remiss, one last thing, <laughs> that if we didn't also, um, I know um, Hillary Carney is not here today as a uh, town planner. She's actually um, been participating remotely, but um, it is no easy task to prepare for these people. I just want the public to know. Um, there is a very, um, I think, intense process to get you guys here. And I thank Claire O'Neill for being part of that. Monika and, and Sarah Marsh uh, for inspiring us to be able to put this document together, not only to help inform you, but for, to consolidate what we do know. And, and that was important information. We couldn't have done it without our town planner, who, again, is in a very limited capacity and has done some great work. So I think that's really important to, to recognize, along with um, people like Lincoln and everybody
everybody else who has contributed um, you mm -hmm. know, to making the information we provided to you today hopefully as informative as it was. It's been very informative. Uh, we want to, as a team, want to say thank you guys for having us. Um, thank you for allowing us to come in today. Jen and Hillary, thank you for organizing all this. Joe, thank you for touring us today and showing us around and helping us with food and set up. And thank you to the board and Lincoln for having us and your input. Uh, thank you to the stakeholders who came out this morning and for the residents. Uh, we've really enjoyed ourselves today. And I want to say a very big thank you to all of our panelists who woke up probably around 5 or 6 a.m. today to get here. Um, we really thank you guys. You don't get paid to do this, so we really appreciate this. Um, on behalf of ULI, I'll say that too. Um, we really hope that um, you guys like our recommendations and it helps you guys get a little bit further to your uh, vision and goals. And we're going to be watching. Um, from Boston and probably coming back down for some of the food festivals. So we, we wish you good luck. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs>